Okay, to dig a little bit deeper, I did some digging and I came to a real quick understanding that, you know, what we had already talked about, that, you know, the composition of the powder, they make the magnet, um, the composition of the mylar that they make the diaphragm from, um, possibly the composition of the copper and, and things like that, the tolerances, the distances here that they've set up for inside the magnetic field, um, all kinds of other different tolerances we're really hard to get that information so you know that's you know going to be kind of hard to really tear the microphone apart that way so let's take another look at that okay so basically we understand some of the specifications when we're talking about microphones now you know and a more in-depth understanding of these materials um, i i don't dissuade you from from going there but really I mean, how much are we going to be able to do about that? You know, if Bob calls us and tells us he made the the diaphragm uh, material out of a different type of composite mylar, you know, that's got super fused with inducted whatever it is that he's come up with, you know, to help the frequency response, that's great. But, you know, he's not going to give us the actual information. What's he going to give us? He's going to give us specifications. So... The reality of it is that, you know, even if we wanted to dig that deep into it and we're all like Albert Einstein, that without any numbers, we're not going to come to any concrete, you know, determinations anyway. I mean, so, I mean, that's just truth. So, you know, the issue is, is that how deep do we want to go in that? Well, you know, I kind of thought about it and, you know, here, let's look at this. You know, you've got like, you know, some standard microphones. And if you look in the recording industry and you go look at some professional mixing and recording engineers, that there's a whole lot of microphones that they just go to. And why is that? Because they know the specifications. They understand the specifications. They're familiar with the specifications. They're in this studio and they go to this studio to record Bob or, you know, Whitney Houston or over there or there that they've got these certain microphones, unless they've got their own pack of microphones, you know, that they're gurus, you know, that they've got some certain microphones that they go to because they understand the specs and how to use them and what their, you know, tolerances are as far as, you know, the specifications and how they can use them. And that seems real obvious. So, I mean, you've got two choices there. Either you dig around because that a lot of times may not boil down to completely that that microphone is actually better for that application. It's that they be familiar with it. It does a good job at what it does, but they're familiar with it. And it can be an industry standard or something like that. That doesn't mean that you get this other microphone that Bob's put out that's really a close approximation to the Shure microphone, um, but it has no, it doesn't have any mileage, you know. I mean, it's not used in all these studios. You know, I mean, but it's going to function just fine for what you want it to do. The problem is if you go off to some other studio to record for Whitney Houston, they might not have that microphone. So you have to take that microphone with you. So that can be a huge determining factor. So, you know, you kind of have to look at it those two ways, you know. And my suggestion on that is that basically, you know, and when we get to the done with this series and you're, we've gone through some usage of the microphones and things like that, that you're going to really want to look at two things that are going to be more important. First of all, what you're trying to capture, you know, as far as the acoustics of the room, um, the instrument you're trying to capture and its frequency range and the range it's going to be playing in, its timbers and harmonics and things like that. And, you know, those are going to be, you know, that and the specifications for those microphones, and you're going to be trying to match those things. So, you know, anytime that you're talking about this transducer, that you're going to those things first and to the issues that we talked about, you know, to give a better understanding of the specifications and all the videos that I had told you to go watch about sound and acoustics and some light audio engineering just to open the door a little bit so that you can apply that transducer into a better to the environment. And, and, you know, this transducer, you know, a lot of times the dynamic selling point is it's a rugged microphone. It's great for, you know, live use. You know, because it's rugged, you know, it just is, you know, and, and you, I mean, you can beat the heck out of the thing, you know, and it's got a lot, it doesn't have a lot of moving parts in it. And it's great for drinking on the road, you know, and can get a pretty good sound, you know. So, you know, the other thing to look at is that, you know, those materials, this one might be different than this one, is that, you know, how are you going to approach that? Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to say, well, 
I don't want to mess with it at all, and I got the money, so I'm going to buy Bob's microphone because of it's got those specifications, and that's great, and I can afford it. Or you're going to go, no, Jimmy's microphone might not do that, but I can compensate that for that, and you'll end it off. Frequency response, prime example, it's got, you know, the lower end frequency response isn't as good, so I know I just throw an EQ on there, boost the low end up a bit, and I'm good to go, you know, and, and it's that simple. You know, some of the other issues you're going to come to with that um, are going to be some issues that you are going to take some research on any specific microphone about how its frequency response is reacting when the microphone's farther away or very close or at angles and things like that, you know, and how it's going to capture the acoustics. And that's more than likely going to boil down for the most part to the specifications because if it's not in the specifications, you know, those things are going to be issues that you're not really going to be able to deal with anyway, unless you tear the microphone apart, you know. I mean, you can either compensate for it in the DAW for issues that you're seeing, noise, you can high pass, low pass, band pass, frequency response, you can put an EQ on it and mess with the frequency, you know, at the capture afterwards to boost certain frequencies or attenuate certain frequencies. You know, those things are easy enough to do with the understanding of sound acoustics that can be a problem you're dealing with sensitivity or something like that and the dynamic range that you know you're trying to capture these acoustics with this microphone but it's not sensitive enough sensitive enough to capture all these reverberations and early late reflections that you know it's it's does it's not sensitive enough to capture that so you're going to go back to those specifications to look at that and you're going to look at the microphone and more than likely you're going to compare it against some other ones and talk to some people that about that microphone that you're buying you know to you know get some direct answers for some questions you might have so you know i think that that can be pretty generalized for most microphones we're going to talk about some issues we will talk about a little bit more in depth and maybe some materials and things like that but on this transducer i think that's where we're at so and the other thing that we wanted to, you know, I directly address is anytime you're having any issues with specifications or usages or anything like that, email the manufacturer, email them, email the distributor, you know, pound them down, send them three or four emails, keep, you know, ask them some real direct questions about why certain things are happening. How can you compensate with this in your microphone? Your microphone does that, you know, it's not as comparable to Bob's, but you know, it's lacking a little bit right there. How can I use your microphone, guy? I mean, how can I buy your microphone? You know, and I know that's messed up, but they're probably gonna want you to buy their microphone anyway, so they might be helpful in, in trying to get you to purchase their microphone and giving you some understandings of how you might be able to compensate for that to so that it works well on your toms, you know, or whatever. Does that make sense? And I'm sure they would, so that's a huge resource. And, you know, so I think that we've come to a point with this that we understand the transducer. And if we go back into the vi things we've already talked about and the videos we talked about, sound and acoustics, that we've got a pretty good understanding of what we have. And we understand what we don't have. We don't have the specifications that we want to have, you know, to deal with that anyway. Here's a prime example. A prime example I was reading about this guy about building a large diaphragm um, dynamic microphone. And he had done some tolerances where the thickness of the mylar was thicker at the outer end and thinner on the inner end. Well, he didn't really give much specification. So basically all I could give you is he told you that and then he gave you a frequency response of it, you know, and a dynamic range of it, you know, in specifications to tell you what it could do. But really not enough information for you to really have any concrete understanding of exactly what he did. And that's the issue. The issue is having, you know, I know that if I have three plus six divided by four, you know, with the square root of two divided by the coefficient of three of one, that, you know, I can get a direct concrete answer. I know what that number is and exactly what that means in chemistry and math and physics. With that, there's no way to deal with that. So there, without having that information, we can't go there anyway. So we have to deal with it with what we do have. What we do have is the knowledge of how the transducer functions, we have the knowledge of the sound and the acoustics, and we have the knowledge of the specifications and what those things are addressing. And we understand with that knowledge of how we can address those issues, compensate for those issues, or make a good decision on that transducer ain't going to work for what I need it to do because it's just not going to perform the way I want it to do and I can't do anything about that other than buying a different microphone or compensating for what it does 
So I think that I want, I know that, I hope that doesn't sound like a dead end because I really do, um, I did some research and some of those things were available and I also got into doing some reading on building microphones and that can really shed a whole lot of light on a whole lot of things. But I found for the most part that where it brought me, it brought me right back to what I was using the microphone on, what I know I needed of that, the understanding of that instrument, its timbers, its range, the acoustic environment that I was trying to capture, and the specifications, and then making a decision on that. Because that other information really didn't help unless I was building a microphone. Does that make sense? Because all the answers are already there. That It's either going to do that or not from the specifications you know, of what's happening. And anything else I had questions about, how was I going to figure that out? The only other way to deal, deal with that was to test it myself. So, you know, that boils down to the next step, and that would be to actually buy the transducer, you know, and, and, and test it, you know. And sometimes you might be able to take it back to Bob and say, Bob, well, I didn't like your microphone. I tested it. It didn't work too well. Um, and you exchange it for another one. Um, if you do that five or ten times, they might start questioning it. But, you know, that's an option. But, you know, be careful you don't get stuck with some microphone that sucks, you know, but you tested it and you know it sucks and now you can't get your money back. So you, the only other way to look at that is a lot of times manufacturers will give you a lot of information on there. I did go to Sure and I was looking up some microphones and I got the information we've already talked about in specifications. I did get some CAD pictures and I got a little bit more information, but none of it was to the point to where I could sit down here and we could sit here and have a, a, a discussion about physics, mathematics, and, and, you know, and chemistry about what's going on there. I mean, there, there was no point to it because I had no numbers or no answers to give you. Even tolerances, I didn't, I couldn't get any of that to give specific tolerances even. So, and there's no point in going there without any numbers or any facts. So we have to go back and rely on the information they're giving us and the information that we have about sound and the information we have about the actual specifics and, and, and specifications of the microphone and base our conclusions from that. Now, at the end of this series, I might not do this for the condenser and the ribbon microphone that we're going to talk about next, but at the end of the series, we're going to talk some about usage of the microphone and things like that. And we're also going to do, I'm going to give you a my opinion thing, and we're also going to do a short series on building microphones in the hope that that understanding can shed some light on to actually what some, some more light onto what's going on, even if we can't have those specific, you know, numbers and, and components of what's happening, that we might have a little bit better understanding to help us use the microphone better. So I certainly hope you, you enjoyed learning about this transducer and the dynamic microphone. And one last thing is that the dynamic microphone has got a huge selling po point of it being a good rough, rugged road microphone. And it can be really useful in the studio if used properly, you know, so don't tell, let anybody tell you that, you know, no, don't use it. Use the condenser, use something else like that, because it does, it is a good microphone. But, you know, some microphones just have a lot better tolerances and specifications um, that, you know, aren't going to deal with the road as well as this microphone. So, you know, that's its huge selling point. So I hope you enjoyed the series up to this point, And we're going to talk about condenser microphones next. Peace, hope, love. See you in the next video.